When you learn online with NEC, you're in charge. You can study when, where and how you like, alongside your other commitments. You set your own study timetable. As an educational charity, our main aim is to support you throughout your course. Start by choosing the course you want to study, then enrol online or by phone. Our experienced and friendly course advice team are here to advise you. Remember, NEC is here to help you achieve your goals. Okay. All right, let's make sure this video doesn't start playing again. And <laughs> hopefully my next slide will come up. Here we go. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NEC's Careers in Space webinar, which is held in partnership with SRO UK and the Royal Astronomical Society. My name's Alice. I'm the Marketing and Communications Executive at NEC, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you all today Lucinda Offer, who is the Education, Outreach and Events Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society. I'm sure Lucinda will have a lot more to say about herself once I hand over, but I can say that she has a very wide scope of knowledge in her field and a lot of experience to share with you all. So I'm sure today will be a very interesting session. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to the chat box on YouTube as that will be where we'll be interacting with you all today. Um, as it's live, obviously, if you've got any questions, do feel free to ask Lucinda just by typing the message in that chat box and it will come through on our end. We'll be able to answer that for you. Um, if anyone would like to try it out now just by saying hello or introducing yourselves in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. I'll give you a second to get your head around that. Um, but yeah, while you're testing out that chat function, I'll hand over to Lucinda without further ado. Enjoy the webinar, everyone. Thanks, Alice. I hope you guys can hear me. Hi, I'm Lucinda Offer, and I'm going to share my screen with you. And while I do that, just to say it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me um, and uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you some of the uh, things that um, I've done in my life. Uh, and um, as she said, I work for the Royal Astronomical Society. I'm the Education Outreach and Events Officer for the RAS. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you a little bit about where I did before. And probably, as you can tell, uh, I have um, an American accent. I am from originally from California a place called um, Silicon Valley, uh, San Jose, San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I grew up. Um, so um, I have come a long way for this talk now. <laughs> I've been here for 10 years. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about careers in the space industry, and that includes astronomy, geophysics, and of course, you know, any space science work. But I wonder if you've ever thought, what, what kind of job might you do in your future? Um, have you thought about it yet, what your, what your working towards, um, I think when I was young, I probably really had a lot of different ideas and really didn't know. Um, I had I had some ideas when I was in secondary school, but I know here you have to know what you're doing in secondary school. But if you didn't, um, I kind of explored through university when I finally got there. Uh, I know things are different in the UK here. Um, and if you even start late, um, that you still have that opportunity to create something that you want to do. Um, is your ideal job science related? There's a lot of really great transferable skills in a science degree. I loved science. Um, I have always loved physics and chemistry. And I was, an e I was even a teacher's aide in my secondary school for my biology um, teacher. And I would set up all the lab um, uh, practicals that we would do. So is it science related? There's um, and and would and would you like to share anything? Was anyone would like to put anything in the chat about what kind of science degree? If you're interested, maybe that's why you're here. You want to learn more about science degrees or what opportunities are there? That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. If you are not sure, so don't worry about it too much. Um, what kind of jobs? I'm going to talk about what kind of jobs you can get with a, a physics degree. Um, what do physicists and astronomers do? I'll give you a little bit of insight. Um, and what options are available to you um, around uh, as, as a job in the UK? And it's really exciting, actually, because the UK is investing a lot of money into a space industry here. It's already really well established since 2009. The UK Space Agency formed when created a name, UKSA. Um, and uh, it has been growing ever since. So I'm going to share a little bit about that. But really, if you get a science degree, you are primed and ready to do lots of different things. 
Um, well, who am I? Um, so my background is in geoscience, geophysics. Um, as you know, I'm an ENO officer for the RAS. Um, I formerly was the executive director of the Mars Society, where I worked for, I was with them for 20 years and their executive director for over 10 years. Um, I uh, was a, a NASA research associate at NASA Ames, which is in the Bay Area, California. Um, I'm former uh, space champion for SRA UK when Tim Peake was an astronaut and uh, he's retiring now, unfortunately. So they're, they're not using us space champions at the moment. Um, I, I'm a teacher of background uh, in um, secondary geoscience education. So I can teach earth science, astronomy, space science, things like that. Um, and I'm uh, accredited in both the United States and then the UK as well to teach physics here. Um, and I'm an honorary visiting fellow at City University of London. These didn't all come at once. <laughs> They're just kind of like things that I've done over over my lifetime. Um, I'm old now, <laughs> and I think I'm I'm actually thinking of moving on to something different, which is kind of exciting and what you can do about life. So, um, and I'll I'll give you more insight about all those things that I've done. Um, if I'm uh, honest about myself, I love art as well very very much. I love being creative. I love imagination. You know, I love watching movies and CGI and all the incredible stuff that creative people can can show us visually. I love visuals. Um, I did get a, a degree in design as well because I loved it so much. So I did get an, a science degree and an art degree. And um, there's no reason why you can if, if you're interested in it. And I, I used to collect comic books when I was a kid. And believe it or not, I also worked in a import record which you probably do you know what a record is <laughs> an import record store in san francisco so i used to buy all the import records um from the uk actually <laughs> to sell them to to djs in san francisco at all the big nightclubs um, but of course when i went to university i focused on geoscience geology geophysics um, I'm very curious about the world. Maybe you are too. I've always been infatuated with the planet Mars and if humans will ever go to Mars and human space exploration, because of course, as an American, uh, space exploration, the Apollo missions to the moon were always a big part of my life. Actually, I was born nine months after the moon landings and my father worked at NASA at the time. Um, he um, he retired at Lockheed Martin. So I've always had space in, in, in really rich experiences in space uh, growing up. So I was very lucky. Not a lot of people um, have that. And so I know I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky as a female. I'm very lucky as a minority. My background is um, Mexican American. So my ethnic background is um, originates in Mexico, um, but I also have bloodlines in Spain, France, and Italy. Um, and uh, I, um, I wasn't really supported as a woman in my family. So I really had to do this by myself because I wanted to do it. And that's not easy, never easy. Um, so it's, it, it helps a lot for you to have support outside, but it also helps if you um, really have that ambition within yourself and, and you can do it. Um, okay, so I had to keep telling myself I can do it. Um, my degrees, are, like I mentioned, uh, geology, art and design. I even did a minor in photography, which I really love. I got my teaching credential, which is a, a postgraduate degree. Um, I went to, I got a master's degree at, in, at the University of Glasgow, science education and communication, and also an, a, um, a certificate course in astronomy at UCL. And um, I attended my local university in San Jose, uh, San Lacan Valley, San Jose State University. And I went to, um, Glasgow, went to Scotland to get my graduate degree. So let me talk a little bit about the Royal Astronomical Society, which is where I work at now. This is a picture of our old logo. And in the center there is a telescope. It's Herschel's telescope, this 40 foot telescope that he um, built a long time ago. He actually used that telescope to discover a planet, uh, planet Uranus. Um, and we didn't realize it was out there until he built the technology, the tools, he was a tinkerer. He was, he was, uh, the, his whole family was, was really very intelligent um, and had lots of incredible skills. Um, and he was a tinkerer and a builder. Um, he wasn't an astronomer out, outright, I believe. And so he, but he was able to build and improve on the instrumentation. And um, so let me just tell you who the RAS is. So we're a professional learned society, academic society of about 4,000 fellows. And we publish scientific experiments, journals, knowledge um, around astronomy, geophysics, and space science. And we just turned 
200 years old in 2020. We had to hold off on our celebrations for a few years, obviously because of COVID. Um, but we're very happy to say that we're now 200 years old. It was started in a pub, people drinking and talking around, um, having sharing a pint uh, in a pub in Holborn in London. And um, they uh, it started there and moved on to different places. And now we're situated at Burlington House in Piccadilly. Um, where the RAS still is. Um, our first president was William Herschel, who, bought, who um, built that telescope. It was um, founded by his son, Jonathan uh, Herschel. And uh, William discovered the planet Uranus, as I mentioned, among un and charted lots of stars. And his sister, Caroline, was also amazing and an astronomer in her own right. Um, who helped him do 2,400 astronomical discoveries together. But Carolyn also um, uh, looked at data and dis made discoveries just by looking at data on her own. And uh, she discovered at least eight comets, I believe more than that. Um, and uh, the RAS um, acknowledged her work as an astronomer, as a woman, Caroline Herschel received the highest honor, the gold medal in 1828 and made her an honorary member in 1835. But there were not men, uh, sorry, there were not female members of the RAS. Um, and so this was a huge, um, thing for the RAS to do in a time when men were like, mm, we don't allow women in here. And they did exactly that because she deserved it. And so do many other women who worked in the field unknowingly. Um, and, uh, and I am their, one of their, one of two education outreach officers for the RAS. So I did speak to you about the Herschel. There's a picture of Carolyn Herschel there and a, a comet that was recently in the night sky. She um, found many other comets that was in the data, but William Herschel's in the bottom uh, bottom left and his son, John, is on the right. Uh, William Herschel was a composer. He was a musician. That's exactly what he was. And then he became an astronomer um, and he was the first RAS president. He was in his old age, so he wasn't our president for very long. It was his son who founded the RAS and put his father as the president before he passed away. Um, John was a polymath. He had lots of skills and lots of interests in biology and photography as well, um, as well as science. Um, and he invented the cyanotypes. If you've ever used that, that's this blue UV paper that if you put a print on top and expose it to ultraviolet rays from the sun, you, then you remove it and put in a little bit of water and, and remove some of that chemicals on, you'll get a nice black and white print, kind of like a, a building map, a, a architectural drawing. Um, and then of course, Carolyn Herschel, who worked beside her, um, her brother, William Herschel, um, helping him then through the years, taught herself and became very knowledgeable about astronomy, became an astronomer herself. Um, so you saw the old original logo that we had with Herschel's telescope. We have now um, updated it for our 200 year anniversary. So we have this new logo, which are telescopes that are looking out at the sky and telescopes looking down at the circle in the middle, which could be us on earth um, because that the, the, the half on the upper on the upper left side represents the sky and the half on the bottom re represents the the ground earth or looking down at earth represents geophysics and the other side astronomy so here's where burlington house is in piccadilly um, and uh, that's the courtyard. So if you, anyone can walk in, if the gates are open, these big black golden gates are open to the front um, of Burlington House, you can walk in and um, you can visit uh, the Royal Academy. Um, there's the Geological Society there, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Linnaean Society, the Society of Antiquaries of London, which holds a lot of royal um, uh, collections of, of all kinds of things from the royal family. Um, that's our door for the RAS. And what we mostly offer to our fellows is uh, a library, a librarian and for her assistance in any research or anything that they wanna look at from a part of our collections. They can come and see, they can hang out in our building. We have a fellows room for them and we offer lots of lectures to the public. And we also publish. So this is our um, cover uh, when we turned um, 200 years old in January 2020. They put it on our new logo on the cover of the Astronomy and Geophysics magazine known as the ANG. Uh, we publish astronomy journals called Monthly Notices and of course Geophysics, so Geophysics Journal International. 
So me as an education outreach officer, what do I do? Well, I get to talk about all those things to the public like you, astronomy, geophysics, space science. Um, I have a, a telescope, obviously, and I have lots of tools that I can bring to, your, to schools or to events. And I also get to go to uh, places like amazing, um, amazing observ observatories like the one in the bottom picture, which is Hurstman Zoo um, in, in Sussex. And I'm just gonna check in with Alice that you can still hear me and everything. Alice, are you still there? So I can't see anything. All I see is my, um, my PowerPoint. So I'm just going to stop sharing just to make sure and make sure it tests. So some people are saying they would like to have be an, an astrophysicist and I see a message from Alice saying all good. So let me see if I can go ahead and, and um, share that again. So hopefully that's being shared with you. Yes. Okay. Um, because I can't see any messages while I'm, <laughs> while I'm doing the PowerPoint. Uh, okay, so what else do I do? Oh, these pictures look a bit fuzzy, but in the top right, you'll see me um, doing some uh, uh, workshop with um, college students and older on how to do some outreach in space. Uh, we do lots of arts and fun crafts with making space hats. I get to meet astronomers. That's a picture of Tim Peake standing next to me. I get to travel around the United Kingdom and talk and teach space science. Um, and go to lots of conferences where I present. Uh, being from Silicon Valley, I love technology. So I love uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. So I get to play with some of the tools like this, which are 3D printed versions of our solar system. Um, the painting in the middle was a workshop I did about painting the surface of the moon that got um, shown in an art gallery. And I'm working with those students in the bottom right doing that work. Um, I also get to visit telescopes, like I mentioned. So there's a couple telescopes on the left. I think the bottom one is from Hurstman Zoo, and the top one is at Marlborough School. Um, beautiful, beautiful telescopes. Um, we get to look at our collections with our fellows at events at RES. We're looking at a solar eclipse there in the middle. Uh, the lens on the bottom right is a lens from Eddington's exploring and proving the theory of relativity for <laughs> Einstein's theory of relativity. That's what was used to do that, that when Eddington did some um, astronomical experiments around the world. Uh, the top right picture is the queen. Uh, the queen, you can see her in bright orange uh, when she was in Burlington House Courtyard doing a visit at the Royal Academy of Art. So we did get royal visits coming to our building as well. Uh, this is some of the outreach that I do out in the world. I'm in Portugal here working with a fellow geoscientist and we're talking about geophysics, seismology, earthquakes. That, so seismology is you know, the vibrations that we feel on our planet when there's an earthquake um, and, and talking about impacts, meteor impacts. And also you might see in the top left there, you might recognize plate tectonics on the surface of our planet. Um, what else? I, I mentioned visiting young people at schools. I even do posters. So that's a poster that I designed and printed. Huge posters. Uh, scientific posters is part of being a science student and a scientist. Uh, you don't have to publish your work, whether it's a poster or presentation, of course, and publish a paper on the work that you did. Um, I get to go to a landing. So this was an event at Oxford University for um, this, oh, which rover? Perseverance. This was Perseverance. No, no. This was InSight. That's right, because there's a badge on the bottom right for the InSight lander, uh, which doesn't move, so it just landed and stays there. And it had a, a seismometer on board and then a robotic arm that put the seismometer on the surface of Mars so that we could feel Mars quakes, not earthquakes, Mars quakes, because they were the vibrations on the planet Mars. Um, and that's uh, Chris Lintot down there, I think with the head of the UK Space Agency and Chris wrote on the chalkboard, it landed and now we get to do cool science. Um, so cool science will happen. And then I had a friend, you can't, you can't, I haven't talked to you about this yet, but in the background is a, um, a simulated space capsule and he's in a simulation space suit considered an analog astronaut working and living in a space hab somewhere on earth to simulate living and working on Mars. And he sent me a message saying hi from Mars to the Royal Astronomical Society. So that was really cool. Oh, 
speaking of the Mars Society, here's their logo. Um, it's a Humans to Mars uh, ex uh, exploration organization, um, nonprofit from 1998, grassroots, international. You can look them up, marssociety.org if you're interested. Started by graduate students in Colorado in the 1970s. They were doing these conferences called Case for Mars conferences every three years. And that then turned into the Mars Society, a few conferences, um, um, a few conferences when it started like three or four, then it became this organization. And they host simulations for living and working on Mars, much like you see at the astronaut here, living on a habitat. A habitat would go on top of the rocket that would blast off to Mars and, and be put on the surface of Mars. Um, it's the picture, the previous image, and I'll show you some more, was the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. And they also have the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station in Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic. Um, they have members and chapters all over the world. So it's not just in, in the United States. And I was with them as a member for 20 years. I'm still a lifetime member and I was an executive director for over 10 years. And so that's something I just recently left in 2021. But my experiences were vast and fun and I was just a volunteer. So get involved. I think you know, this Monday was the King, you know, we had the King's coronation on Saturday and he was pushing for volunteers on Monday to go out and about the UK and do volunteers. Well, that's a really good way to get started and being and looking into what you're interested in doing, whatever it is, even if it's, it isn't science, um, to, to become a volunteer. So you could volunteer to live and work on Mars. That's me on the ATV on the far right. Um, they had uh, robotic competitions, which I assisted with in Europe, in the UK, and in the United States, but we also have them in Canada and in India. And then you see some simulation analog astronauts there um, traversing a, a Martian landscape, but on Earth and um, living in a habitat that's supposed to simulate living on Mars. Here's some other images of the um, habitat, the Mars Desert Research Station. They had two observatories. One was a solar telescope. So you can see she's opening up to observe the sun using a proper filter because you don't look at the sun ever directly with your eyes because it could damage your uh, the cones and rods in your eyes. So don't do that. She's using proper equipment. She's probably observing it from a computer and has a good filter on that telescope to look at the sun. Um, there's also a science dome. You see the geodesic dome. Let me see if I can use my so geodesic dome here. Here's the habitat. You can see these are two observatories here. And right behind on the other side of this hill here is an engineering a dock where we have robots and things like that. And she's working under the fume hood doing some uh, inoculations of some sort of for biology experiment that she's doing on simulation Mars. I mentioned the robotic competitions. You can see all the different countries on the bottom right that participated. You can see all their rovers there. These are big 50 kilogram rovers um, that they come out to Utah to do an obstacle course and see whose rover was the best. And of course, we also get they also get television crews out there doing interviews and and doing TV shows and things like that. Oh, this is me when I was much younger. I don't know if you can still see a picture of me, but you can tell I look way different from this. And again, I said I've been with them for over 20 years now, um, doing being in a um, mock spacesuits. Um, create, I created those human factor workstations in the upper left hand corner because I also like to tinker and build um, and putting kids into the simulation suit and I'm also working at the Mars Desert Research Station on the bottom left. You can see me there on the bottom of the stairs. Um, here's a, another picture of the European Rover Challenge in the upper left hand corner. We had Tim Peake visit for that. But you can see we've had other celebrities come out and pretend living and working on Mars. We have Brian Cox in the upper right hand corner who did a, a television show about the Mars Desert Research Station for BBC. And the very fuzzy picture is Jack and Ozzy Osbourne. You can see Ozzy Osbourne on the left. I don't know if you, you might be too young. Ozzy Osbourne is the lead singer of Black Sabbath back in I think the 70s or 80s. Uh, too young for me as well. I'm too young as well. Uh, but um, um, Ozzy Osbourne was out there with his son doing an Amazon TV show as well. So lots of celebrities come out to do it as well. And I have this video, but um, I see, okay, we have maybe, I'm guessing 20 minutes. I think I'm gonna show two minutes of this video and hopefully you can have sound. I'm gonna give it a go. I don't know why you're on Mars. Maybe you're there because of the magnificent science that can be done there. The, the gates of the wonder world are opening 
in our time. Or maybe we're on Mars because we have to be, because there is a deep nomadic impulse built into us. I wasn't actually interested before in going to, to space, going to, to Mars or something like that. I was more into design and mechanics than the, the big idea of helping humanity survive in the future. Yeah? But it caught me. It actually caught me. We come after all from hunter-gatherers and for 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers. And uh, the next place to wander to is Mars. When I was in high school, I had two telescopes. I thought I wanted to study astronomy, but then I was also trying to learn what, it, what it's really about. I remember I saw a robot, rover, and then I decided I'm gonna study engineering. Two years after that, two years after having that dream, I joined the robotic team uh, on my university and we started to work together, uh, creating a Scorpio rover. In case of the rover challenges, the thing is that the people participating in these challenges are already people involved in robotics, already like hobbies, building things uh, on their own, but they want this, this one thing to focus on. So you can imagine like a team of eight, nine people who finally build something meaningful, actually for the world. What you're seeing is the power of an idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. And this idea of exploring Mars has brought people from all over the world. What it does is it brings a lot of uh, young people with fresh ideas um, about how we can solve problems. And that's how you grow innovation. Uh, and that's exactly what the space industry needs. My job is to prototype things. And honestly, uh, Scorpio project was the first project when I really had to like think about a lot of things and design them and then try and then of course fail and try again. The important thing is that you really need to know that it's okay to fail if you want to have this kind of job. And I think I would never be prepared for that if I was not part of a student competition like this. This was a bridge for them, and I was really happy to hear about this, that as a result of their work building rovers and competing them in the U.S. and in Poland, they were in the space program now. When you're passionate about space, you can either be a scientist or you can be an engineer. And for me, that was a very hard choice. At the end, I chose to be an engineer, and today I'm very happy about that. But since then, since that one choice, I was very focused. Uh, on my goal, and my goal was to work one day for the space industry, preferably in a big agency like today. My so I'm going to pause it there because you can watch it. If you look up the European Rover Challenge, and they did a fabulous job on this video, or it's called the ERC for short. In 2018, they did this video, and I thought it was really well done. And they also had, obviously, they had Tim Peake there, which is really a great idea. Um, so I did work for NASA at NASA Ames Research Center in um, Silicon Valley, where I grew up. Um, as you may know, it stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration as a United States government agency um, and implements and promotes the U.S. space program. And they have 10 campuses around the United States. I worked at the one in California on the West Coast, which is situated right on the border. So it's in both cities, Mountain View and Sunnyvale. <laughs> um, it's known for its wind tunnels that work on fluid dynamics, so aerodynamics of wing wing. Um, uh, design. So uh, had these huge wooden wind tunnels that you could walk into, of course, um, put your instrument or whatever you're developing there and test it, see how good it is aerodynamically. Um, I worked at the Earth and Space Science Laboratory at Building 245, um, and I was part of the Spaceward Bound team where we would um, put teachers in the field with scientists and do lots of experiments looking at hardy life forms in extreme environments around the world um, to talk about um, uh, life in in the solar system or life in the universe uh looking for could there be life on mars for instance was one of the big but also could there be life on titan or in saladus um so i traveled to many different places the mojave desert looking at um tardigrades i was in australia uh there we were looking at uh the dawn of life um and uh, stromatolites, which is why Perseverance rover is on Mars right now. It's also looking for stromatolites in Yezero Crater. Um, I was in New Zealand looking at geothermal vents in the Tapo uh, volcanic zone. Um, 
and uh, they've been um, uh, things all over. There's one in the UK, a Whitby mine in um, in Whitby. <laughs> so there's an astrobiology center there run by the University of Edinburgh. Um, so what did I get to do for NASA? Well, I got to do kind of events, like I said, travel. They sent me to the Mars Desert Research Station for to be an uh, uh, analog astronaut, even though I'd been there um, before many times, I got to become an astronaut for NASA, uh, but an analog one. And why they sent me there to test a $25,000 rover. You can see it there sitting there with me um, to live amongst the crew and it's still there. Uh, I did that back in 2011, so 12 years ago. Um, uh, and of course I did presentations for NASA and lots of, I think in the bottom right, we were in the outback of Australia testing a spacesuit. I don't think I put any pictures of, uh, of that in here. Sorry about that. Um, maybe I did. Uh, what else? I get to meet, there's another astronaut uh, that is, um, oh, can somebody look him? <laughs> Charlie, Charles, uh, I can't remember his surname. Um, Charles, I'm gonna say Bolden but that's that time right, Charlie Bolden. Um, he was, uh, it's terrible, I shouldn't forget his name. Uh, he was a huge influence and um, uh, a role model for me. He was a, a pilot of the space shuttle missions um, and he he wants to go to Mars and his he, he wants his children to go to Mars. So um, uh, I got to meet him. He was actually visiting the UK and that's where I met him there. You can see me in the middle uh, at Abu Dhabi um, doing some work in, in, the, in the middle of the desert looking for extreme life forms. Um, you see here in the bottom picture, there's actually life in that sabka or salt flat down there in the bottom. Um, and the rover that I tested uh, at the Mars Desert Research Station. And of course, if you've ever done a balloon flight, just look uh, with data loggers to look at wind speed and direction and things like that. Um, you can put up a balloon um, uh, to, to launch a balloon to do some experiments at, as a school, actually. Oh, there's the spacesuit that we were testing in the um, outback uh, in the upper right hand, upper left hand corner there of the screen. Um, that was a, a, a spacesuit, one of many that was being tested by NASA. A close up picture of me on the ATV in the bottom right, uh, bottom left. Uh, the stromatolites on the bottom right of me sitting there next to them with my hat on. Um, those are cone shaped ancient bacteria. Um, that uh, f was the reason why we have so much oxygen in our atmosphere now on Earth. So they created, a little, they used a lot of the CO2 uh, in our early formation of our planet Earth. And as it cooled and, and, and um, became more solid as on the crust, um, these released, took in that CO2, released oxygen in our atmosphere and allowed evolution to continue. And at some point on Mars, this happened. They may have stromatolites on the surface of Mars, but Mars's evolution stopped four billion years into its life. And so that's why we've sent this Perseverance rover there to look at what did it create these stromatolites and was Mars about to create a rich oxygen, oxygen rich atmosphere, but something happened to Mars and it just stopped. Um, so those are the questions that we wanna know. And of course um, I did this poster uh, for a conference in San Francisco. Um, I can't remember what it was called. It's one of the big geoscience conferences, uh, American Geophysics Union, I think it was. And so I did that talking about all the work we did in New Zealand. Oh gosh, how much time do we have? And space careers in the UK. So um, the UK, like I mentioned early on, is investing a lot of money into space industry. Um, in 2030, they expect 100,000 jobs. Um, there'll be jobs about building mostly instrumentation, satellites, launches, because the UK, is, I'll show you in a second, is doing a lot of space launch facilities in the, around the UK. Uh, this is a picture of eMerlin, which is a, a astronomy, a radio astronomy array uh, situated in the UK. Um, but the UK has also become now a headquarters for a worldwide um, astronomy array that I'm going to show you. Um, first of all, here are the spaceports. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaceports um, proposed for the United Kingdom. I believe three of them are um, uh, are being. One of them was recently used, Spaceports Cornwall for Virgin Virgin Orbit. Um, I think Sutherland has already broken ground, and I'm not sure about the Shetland one. I think. Um, I'm not sure uh, where those the rest of them are, but I think I know three of them. I can't remember the third, um, but you can see all seven of them here. Shetland uh, spaceport, one in the Outer Hebrides somewhere, spaceport one, it's called uh, spaceport. Uh, someone's going to have to pronounce that better than me, Macrahanish uh, spaceport in Presswick. 
uh, and Spaceport Snowdonia. And Presswick, I know, is um, in Scotland because that's where I used to have to fly out of, of Presswick Airport. So, um, so these are to do satellite launches via different type of vehicles. A Virgin Orbit was, I think, a plane launch. So the rocket was connected to the middle of an airplane and the airplane flew up to a certain altitude and then the rocket was supposed to take off at a higher altitude. So that's a launch, a type of launch. But of course we might have uh, medium, small to medium sized rocket launches that can launch satellites up in an orbit. So in 2020, the UK has um, uh, looked at how many employees are in the UK space sector. So you can get an idea here. A bulk of them uh, are in the north and the south, um, over 8,000 in Scotland and almost 10,000 here where I'm at in Oxfordshire, England. Uh, Harwell, I, we have um, uh, a Cal Cullum Space Center here, or Cullum, Cullum Science Center, excuse me. And of course, Harwell, which is really big. And even Swindon, where the UKSA is headquartered. So a lot of space down here in the Southeast, but you could see all over the UK, there are opportunities to get involved um, in the space, uh, space industry. Uh, one exciting thing is the square kilometer array. They're building these huge arrays to answer questions like, how did stars and galaxies form? What about a magnetic field um, of stars and galaxies? Um, how did life come to be in the universe? All these big, big questions by putting these um, square kilometer of, of um, uh, uh, observatories, radio uh, observatories, uh, to answer these questions. One big one in Australia and one big one in South Africa. And who gets to look over these? The United Kingdom does, is the headquarters of the Square Kilometer Array in Jodwell Bank. They're going to need a lot of help, data scientists, astronomers, to manage these huge, these huge arrays in other parts of the world, um, helping us answer these important questions about uh, our, our place in this universe and the, and, and the world around us, the universe around us. So this is huge for the United Kingdom. In addition to space launches, satellite instrumentation, radio astronomy is, gonna, is huge in this country. What else can you do with a, starting with a physics degree, specializing in astronomy or whatever you're interested in? You could do research science and astronaut. You could be a teacher. Oh, that's how I started out. Um, you could be a radio astronomer, like I mentioned, or a satellite engineer. Those are huge industries in the United Kingdom. But also Earth observations, very important as a geoscientist. Uh, obviously, you um, are very well aware, should be, of climate change. Um, so uh, also seismology, which is earthquakes. Um, maybe don't affect us too much, but I think we had an earthquake uh, this year or last year in the UK. Um, space weather management can affect our satellites or your mobile phone. So if you care about your mobile phones and using TikTok, you might want to become a sp space weather risk manager. <laughs> uh, a marine geophysicist physicist, looking at the um, mapping the areas of, of around the UK, the waterways around the UK. Um, oil industry, which is really important. Where is the UK going to get its oil from moving towards the future? And the British Antarctic Survey, a huge exploration group that does a lot of work in the very, very cold areas of, on our planet. A lot of important research. I'm not going to read all through these, but I'm just going to give you an idea. Looking at the time, it's almost 2.40. Um, some of them, you could be an astrobiologist. This is a huge um, thing where sci scientists are looking at what kind of data are we getting back from spacecraft? Are there is there life on other objects in our solar system? Mars being one of them. So you do your A levels and you don't have to get straight A's in this stuff. Just letting you know, um, and I have a, a PDF that'll show you. So some of the scientists who become these these people have didn't get straight A's. They might have gotten a, a B, a C, an A, um, or they might have taken their time. They might have done it later in life. So you know, um, when you're interested, if you're interested, don't let anything stop you or get in your way, and don't let anyone tell you something that you can't do it because you can, if you really want it. Um, okay, so you do a degree in, in a sciences, science that you like. I prefer geology personally. <laughs> so the, the um, astronauts who went to the moon were fantastic pilots, but the one science they had to be taught in order to go to the moon was geology because they had to know which rocks 
which was the most precious cargo. And the reason they were going to the moon was to bring back rocks from the moon so we could learn more about our place in, in the solar system. And, and they had to know geology. So geology, the, hello, I might be biased, but that's my favorite. Um, and then you can go on and do a master's in astrobiology and, and a PhD if you're interested in. Okay, becoming an astronaut, astronaut is more and more, is becoming more and more possible these days. Um, you know, there was a big call out for an, ast an ESA astronaut and we they just uh, showed all these brand new astronauts. I think it was, was that earlier this year or, or uh, sometime last year? I'm sorry, I don't have a picture, I should do. The UK, I think, at least has two or three new astronauts. Um, so they're training them right now. They need about two years of training before they get ready to do any sort of testing of going to the International Space Station, for instance. Um, so it is a possibility these days now to get yourself ready. What kind of things do you need to do to be to get ready? The, the easiest and fastest way to become an astronaut, uh, work for the Air Force, um, uh, the Royal Air Force and become a pilot because they always need someone to drive something <laughs> or to pilot something. Um, astrophysicists, which I have lots of colleagues at work who are astrophysicists, pretty much everyone around me is an astrophysicist and I'm just the geoscientist, geophysicist. Um, but it's uh, physics, you start off, you specialize in astronomy. Of course, you, you can um, get a degree in lots of other uh, other A-levels, of course, you have to take triple science, as you may know, a four-year degree in physics, and you can specialize then in astrophysics, astronomy, space physics, etc. lots of other options for you. Because maybe you want to be a solar physicist, which is also an astrophysicist, but one who studies the sun, or you might be, want to become a planetary scientist. So lots of um, options today uh, to do that. Maybe an engineer, someone who wants to build the craft, or build this, this, this instrument that goes on the satellite. Um, so a lot, if you're good at tinkering and building something and thinking in th three dimensions, um, then maybe a space engineer is for you. I mentioned a planetary science, which is a lot of geoscience background, because um, looking at the magnetism, the hydrology, hydrogeology, or hydrology actually of, of, a, of a planet, um, the mapping of a planet, geomorphology or seismology, looking at the tectonics of a planet, lots of different also areas in planetary science as well. Space law, who owns what? Who's allowed to do what? Only recently did they allow any private company to go to the moon. And um, I think it was Japan that recently tried to land an object, a probe on the moon, and they lost contact with it. This happened uh, maybe two weeks ago. Um, and it was the first private company ever allowed to send in uh, something to the moon. Everything else has been either under you know, NASA, typically, or or um, has been maybe ESA. Uh, unfortunately, there was one from uh, Israel who sent without any permission and it crash landed on the moon as well. So that was really bad. Um, but you know, you need to get the lawyers involved. People are breaking rules. So space law is really important too. Um, more unusual jobs, science present presenter, maybe you're the next Brian Cox, a film TV advisor, space journalism, spacecraft salesperson, because people have to buy those instruments or those satellite launches educational resource developer, space medical specialist. So again, there's lots of places in Europe as well. So this is the map of the UK. You see Harwell there, ESA. And where else are ESA um, campuses? You see around the in Europe there. Um, how many jobs uh, does ESA have uh, as engineers or scientists or managers? So not just the science degrees. You also need to be a good manager, administrator. Technical services are also needed to uh, run the, the space organizations uh, or these private space industry. They also need managers and business people and, and technical staff. So not just engineers and scientists. So, so that's something to note as well if you're interested in being part of moving humanity towards space. And of course, this is so exciting. Exoplanets are so amazing. Could there be life out there? And we are finding more and more that there are planets, not all of them are Earth-like, but we've confirmed over 5,000 planets as of March of this year um, that are around 3,962 other stars, other solar systems, not just our sun is just one of millions of other so uh, solar systems out there, but we've only confirmed almost 4,000 of them, and 856 of those systems have more than one planet. So similar to our solar system, which has 
we're, we're down to eight planets now. So <laughs> Pluto's no longer a planet. Sorry, I had to say it. And if you want to learn more, you can go to Google Sky High and Down to Earth, which is the RAS's booklet about, I don't know, I think we have 20 different scientists in the UK there, and they talk about what A-levels, what marks they got in those tests. Um, you know, what did they study? What, how did they do it and, and why they're doing it? So lots of really cool information in this, pat, in this booklet. Um, and if you wanted to know, astronomers use scientific techniques to study the origin and makeup of stars, planets, galaxies, and other celestial bodies because we've got um, dwarf planets out there, we've got asteroids out there, we've got space debris out there, and as well as the origin and the structure of the universe in general. And geophysicists, hey, apply physics concepts and techniques to study the gravitational, magnetic, and electric fields of the Earth and further our knowledge of both the planet's interior and surface of our planet. So I would like you to leave you with, I'd like to leave you with some last thoughts. And I hope that this talk was helpful to you and showed you some career paths that you might be interested in, in, in giving a go. But a few last words. Who am I? Overall, I'm an action, I'm a doer. I like to make things happen. I love organizing and I love then enjoying making a difference for other people. That is just be my, my life motto, my purpose in life is to make a difference for others. And so that's why I do what I do. That's why I enjoy being an outreach officer and doing this type of work. And what do I believe? Okay, well, I'm not getting too deep into this, but you know, in the natural world, I really do believe that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. We all make up all kinds of excuses. I'm tired, I'm too busy. I don't have enough money, you know, yes, there'll be lots of obstacles in your way. But if it's something you really want to do, like, you know, when you were a kid and you really wanted something, you would go get a job if you had to. You, you would like mow the lawn or do gardening or do chores in the house, anything to raise money to go get that thing you wanted. Same thing as an adult, not just to get money, but to go for the things that you really want to do. So if it's, I think it's possible for you to do, don't let people tell you it's not or that you can't do it because again, anything is possible. You can do it. And my last words, if you're thinking of applying for something and you're not sure if you should, the answer is always yes. Apply, 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 because you're never going to get it if you don't at least apply. People always think, oh, oh they're never going to pick me. Well, they're definitely not going to pick me if you don't put your name down to, to do it. So put your name down to do it. Fill out the form, send it in, email it, whatever. Apply. Um, because at least you got that part done. It's good practice. Um, and one of them is going to come back and say yes to you. And that's it for me. I want to thank you so much for being here with me. Again, I'm Lucinda Offer. You're welcome to email me if you have any questions around careers in the space industry, astronomy, and geophysics, or if you want to know more about the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, but thank you very much, and thank you to Alice. Hi, Lucinda. I'm back in the webinar now. If you're also here with me. Hi. Hi. So thank you very much for that. It was very interesting, very insightful and amazing to think kind of of, all of what you've done just from coming from your first job in record imports. Um, <laughs> while you were speaking, we have had some questions in the chat box. So if you're happy to, we can just go through those now. Yeah, Sounds like a lot of people are interested in a lot of different things that you said. Um, so first of all, we have one from Eden. I'll just pull it up on the screen. They were asking, studying GCSE astronomy because they're passionate about space and eager to learn. What ways can I contribute to our collective space mission outside of a technical role? Okay, so studying GCSE astronomy, excellent, well done, because it's not part of core GCSE here in the UK. It's extracurricular, you have to take it outside of school. So that's a really first good step actually, is either your school already offers GCSE astronomy or your you're doing whatever it takes to, to, to take GCSE astronomy, which I think there are also online programs. And just to mention, the RAS does do a free two-year course for GCSE astronomy. We usually do it to the local area of London. Over COVID, we did it all around the UK because it was online only. Um, and we're not sure if we're going to do that again, but if you're local to the UK, you can contact me and see if you're interested. So that's a really good first step. Um, there, is there any way you could volunteer? I know there is a Mars Society in the United Kingdom. Um, maybe go visit some of Harwell campus. If there's any sort of events happening at Harwell or any of the launch facilities that they, um, if you've been down to Spaceport Cornwall, that's a good place to visit if they're having any events that you could go to. 
go to a blue dot festival at Jodwell Bank. Go visit Jodwell Bank. They also have some really great facilities there to learn more about the industry and how to get involved. So yeah, check out your local resources like that here in the UK, even the National Space Science Center. Yeah, we're quite lucky that we do have so many resources available in the UK. It's something I would never have thought of um, just from living in the UK, but yeah. Um, should we go to the next question? We've got, for ESA, which language would you say is most important or frequently used other than English? Yeah, definitely English. I mean, it depends. If you're going to be an astronaut, the second language you have to learn is Russian. <laughs> but um, I, every, not everybody has an ear for language. So like I enjoy language and I, I kind of, I can even, I can, when I hear an accent, I, I do, my brain mimics it for some reason. Uh, and I took German and Japanese and of course, and because I'm Mexican, I'm, I'm also very familiar with Spanish. Um, but any sort of Latin based uh, language is helpful just to get you, anything it could be Spanish. Um, but I think English is so well used these days, pretty much everyone has English. And I think if you just choose one other Latin based language initially, um, then it'll help you to understand lots of different languages. But because I know Spanish, I can hear and understand some Italian, um, some French, some German, and Japanese is based on A, I, E, O, U. So that alphabet system, which is also the same in Spanish, let me tell you, Japanese was not hard. It was pretty easy to learn. Um, so it, if you're interested, try Japanese. It's also fun too to know. And they've got a space, uh, they've got a space uh, 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 organization too. So great, JAXA. Good to know. Another one from Leva is, what's your opinion on the controversy about the moon being a planet? It's not something I've heard of before. Okay, so I've not heard of that controversy. I'll say controversy. So I'm just to say it the way I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, we know the moon to, um, to be a, a, a celestial object, uh, a satellite. It's a, um, a natural satellite that revolves around our planet. Um, it is not a, a planet. A planet is um, a, a, you know, an object that, that goes around our sun. That's a planet. So already the moon cannot be a planet because what does it go around? It goes around our earth. So that that that's already debunked <laughs> just from that definition there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, let's move on to Julia, wondering if there are any kind of psychology related careers in the space field. Absolutely. Um, one of the when I when I was a NASA analog 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 astronaut, excuse me, at the Mars Desert Research Station. Uh, one of my colleagues from NASA was also a psychologist and she was doing experiments on, she was taking our temperatures, she was taking our some sort of uh, wavelength readout of our brain, you know, um, she was she was keeping a log. So she was doing a, some psychological research for space exploration and she worked at NASA. So absolutely. Yeah, definitely something to look into. I'm sure the resources you've mentioned probably also have information about those areas as well. Great, and I think we've got one more that's just come through. I'll pop that on the screen as well. I did a degree in computer science. I want to do a second undergraduate degree in physics or mathematics. So what research could I contribute to with this background? Probably all sorts. <laughs> yeah, physics, uh, physics and mathematics are, are pretty amazing and, and, and well done you doing uh, that computer science and be interested in physics or mathematics. They're all very much related, especially mathematics and computer science. Um, but I'd tell you the big industry right now is data science, which those would be very, very helpful for artificial intelligence. So for instance, lots of the things that are happening now, we're looking at old data. And anytime and when you're looking at data, you can discover new things, which has actually recently happened. And we're getting so much data. I mean, all these instruments we're putting in orbit or we're sending to, to look at other uh, bodies in our solar system. We're going to get all, we're getting all this data back, all this the stuff that we're putting on Mars or around the moon or later on uh, on the way to Jupiter. Juice is, is at Jupiter now. So we're getting all this data back and we need help uh, to crunch this data, to look at this data, to analyze this data. So all those uh, skills that you'll learn in either physics or mathematics will help humanity learn more about the universe around us. Great, thank you, Lucinda. I think that's all the questions for the time being. Thank you, everyone, for sending your comments in. It's been great to have this sort of discussion. Um, 
if that's good for everyone, I'll just put my last slide up on the screen as there's a few little bits to go through. Um, as I said, thank you everyone for watching. If any of the career paths that Lucinda's discussed today have piqued your interest, or if you'd like to study a qualification, maybe to take your first step down a new career path, feel free to check out NEC's website. It's just www www.nec.ac.uk you'll be able to find information about all of our courses on there and we're also offering 10% off for you guys who have joined the webinar today on space career options or also careers in the wider just green eco-friendly sector so that would be astronomy geography all the sciences as well as maths um, and as I said the code is just NEC10 to use on our website or over the phone. You've got your contact details on there as well for our course advice team if you'd like any further advice on what subject might be right for you or just if you'd like to get enrolled. I know a few of you are already enrolled, so that's a great first step for sure. And yeah, well, thank you very much again to Lucinda. It's been great to hear from you and thank you everyone for coming along today. I hope you have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.